excited to be here. I was joking around. I brought a couple people with. My, my, my creative pastors are here. Thanks for joining us. Hi, peeps. And Aaron and Delphine. I was joking around with them. I just, I, I just leaned over. I said, you know, our church is almost blacker than this. So I'm right at home. So I just let you guys know. This is, you guys are my people and this is my crowd. I love you, Pastor Reggie. And so I'm ready to go. I got a word from the Lord. Um, let me just say real quick, um, I, I just want to, I'm from Hammond, Indiana, and um, you know, sometimes people say what well, good comes from Hammond, I can tell you there's a move of God going on in our city right now, dead things are coming back to life, I'm seeing, we're, we're seeing our city restored before our very eyes, and it's been such a blessing to see a move of God, not just through one church and one name, but through churches, pe people who call on the name of God. And, it's been so awesome. I, I send greetings from my wife and my, my six-year-old son, Daniel, and my wife, Taylor. Um, they're, uh, they're on a, a flight right now to, um, to see her parents, so she wishes she could be here, but she sends her love. Let me say, I've been married 15 years, and uh, it just keeps on getting better and better. And um, I like to say my wife is my Chick-fil-A. She's my number one with a lemonade and <laughs> y'all ain't ready <laughs> i'm like a sanctified m and up up here bars on bars okay here we go and uh <laughs> and uh before you're seated tonight i i do want to give honor where honor is due tonight um it's cool to kind of get around different leaders in, in times but i'm telling you, you guys have some of the best leaders across the globe and pastors reggie in London, I love you guys already. It's like a family party. And I was joking around with Pastor Reggie. I said, I first saw you guys on Facebook and I stole your stage design idea and just brought it and took credit for it. So I guess I owe you something. I should give an offering tonight. But, uh, um, your pastors, I just noticed like right away, they're like, they're so cool. Um, they're like the picture of relationship goals, right? They're swaggy and they're anointed and um i love you guys i watched your live stream on sunday and i think i rededicated my life to the lord it was so powerful pastor i was trying to like figure out how to shout and dance and my lit it was so powerful and, and i'm just excited to be here but y'all can be seated tonight in the presence of the lord How many excited for the word of the Lord tonight? Um, I got really excited when I saw this year's uh, theme for camp meeting, um, On Earth As It Is In Heaven. And, um, you know, our, our church's vision back home is in Hammond, Indiana, as it is in heaven. And I think there, there's a kingdom people that are coming together in this hour. And I want to speak to kind of the DNA and attitude of what I believe a citizen of heaven looks like. And tonight, I just want to try to set the table. I, I agree, we're, we're in a move. And I think um, tonight, what I want to talk to is just our attitude is the people of God, is citizens of the kingdom of God. And I think it's important to remember tonight, before I get to my text, that be, before we're citizens of the United States of America, before we're citizens of the city that you live, live in, before I'm a white man, before you're a black woman, before you're a Hispanic woman, before you're a black man, before you're a Democrat, before you're a Republican, before you're middle class, upper class, or lower class, before you're any of those things, those things don't define you. What defines us is if we've given our life to Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And sometimes people are like, how do you guys come together when you don't look alike? Because I don't come together under a flag of my country. I come together first under a flag of the kingdom. And I'm telling you, his blood covers all. Yeah. And I think this is just the heartbeat of what it looks like to be um, in the kingdom of God and a citizen of the kingdom. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 13. If you're like my church, just turn your Bible on. <laughs> John 13. I want to look at verses 33 through 35 tonight. Um, I'm not going to preach long. Um, I'm expecting God to move. And um, I'm going to read from a new translation of the Bible tonight. I just It's some fresh verbiage that I really like that I kind of want to pull out a little bit. It's called the, the Passion Translation. And um, if you guys could get John 13, 33 through 35, this is the scene here. Let me give you a little context. 
Um, what we see here is Jesus is 33 years old. He was with his 12 disciples in an upper room, and it was his last night with them on the earth. And in just a few hours, he would be betrayed, uh, put on trial, and unjustly murdered. And Jesus has some parting instructions for his disciples, and I believe instructions for us tonight. And here is the word of the Lord. Jesus says this, My dear friends, I only have a brief time left to be with you, and then you will search long for me. But I tell you what I told the Jewish leaders, you'll not be able to come to where I am. So I give you a new commandment. Remember that new commandment. Love each other just as much as I've loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, all y'all will know. Everyone will know that you're my true followers. Tonight from this text, I just want to share a message on the topic of rule number one. Rule number one. Let me pray and then I'm going to dive in tonight. Lord, help us never to forget rule number one. Amen. You guys know God hears short prayers too. Sometimes you can say more to God in three words than you do in three hours when you get to the point. <laughs> a man by the name of Warren Buffett is currently listed as the world's third wealthiest person in the world with a net worth of $85 billion with a B. How many of you would like to have one of those billion dollars? <laughs> Mr. Buffett has made most of his money as the CEO of a holding company called Berkshire Hathaway, and he's built most of his net worth living his life and setting up his business by one rule that he's become famous for. Warren Buffett is quoted all over the place saying, rule number one in his life is never lose money. Rule number two is simply never forget rule number one. Rule number one for Buffett for, for never lose money speaks to the mindset, the attitude of a sensible investor. And he's saying a sensible investor is not a senseless person. They're not a gambler. They don't go into an investment with an attitude that it's okay to lose money. You, you do your homework. You're informed with what you're going to do. You do your homework a little bit more. And, and because of rule number one in his life, Buffett only invests in companies he thoroughly researches and understands. Now, now this rule in his life sets the behavior for how he operates his company or his kingdom, if you will. And just as Warren Buffett has rules for his kingdom, God also has rules for his kingdom. And sometimes I think we look right past this sometimes in the Gospels. But when Jesus came to earth, Jesus came preaching and his main message was that of the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. And sometimes um, when Jesus came, he came to 2,000 years ago. And, and you see this time and time. This is what he came preaching. He came heralding the kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 1, Jesus is born. We see this picture of him being born. He, he goes and he's baptized. And you guys might know the picture if you know the scriptures. And the, the clouds open and the dove descends representing the Holy Spirit. And this voice of the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And can I just point out today, that was before Jesus ever did one thing on earth. God was already pleased with his son. And that's a message for another day. But sometimes you got to know that God is pleased with you, not based on your performance, because of your position as a son and daughter in his house. And so Jesus is baptized, and, and by the Spirit, he's taken out into the desert, and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Jesus comes back to this earth, and this is the moment that all these decades of history have been pointing to. This was the moment that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 40. They saw the signs of John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, hey, listen, you guys think I'm awesome. There's one coming after me that's so great I'm not even worthy to tie the, the shoes that he's wearing. There's one coming after me, listen, who, who is so unbelievable that I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize with fire. And all the signs are pointing to this moment. The Israel people can see all these things. The Jewish people see these things coming together. And Jesus comes to the earth. And in Mark 1.15, his first proclamation to start his public ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is on hand. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, this was the moment that these people had been waiting for. The moment that they've been waiting decades and decades for and the people could see these signs coming. And from that moment, Jesus preached the message of the kingdom of God. 
And you know what? 126 times in the Gospels alone, in the English Standard Version of the Bible, the kingdom of God is mentioned. How many of you think if it's mentioned 126 times in the Gospels, it's kind of important? Yeah. And it keeps on popping up. And, and what is this kingdom? Just so we're all on the same page, this kingdom of God. Simply put, the kingdom of God is the reign of God. It's the rule of God. The basic meaning of the word kingdom in the Bible is God's kingly rule, his reign, his lordship, his governance. And when Jesus came to the earth, he came proclaiming, my reign, my kingdom is on hand. But when he came, people were waiting for him for so long. Jesus, I think when he was on earth, he was fighting. And I'm going somewhere with this. You guys are just looking at me. Just wait. I'm just laying a foundation. I'm going somewhere. But when he came... A lot of people were getting it twisted who he was because they thought he came to set up an earthly king. But Jesus was like, I didn't come to sit on an earthly throne. I came to reign from a heavenly throne. And I think that's why you see time and time again, Jesus would heal people and say, don't tell anybody what I just did. Because he was trying to fight this tension that they were going to start a political revolt and put him in a position he didn't came to fill. And I think that's time and time again. They're like, get on a white horse. Jesus said, you still got it twisted. I'm riding a donkey. You know, because I didn't come to set up my kingdom down here and reign down here. I came to rule from heaven above. I didn't come to rule a political kingdom. I came to be crucified, and I'm going to win your life by raising from the grave and ascending to heaven. And so they kept on getting this whole thing twisted. Jesus is saying, listen, my kingdom is here, but it's a little tricky. It's still coming. In that we, we see a portion of this here. Jesus is saying there's a portion here. The kingdom of God is on hand. And Jesus is reminding people time and time again, the kingdom is here, but this is tricky. It's still coming. And that's why when we're on this earth, Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. On earth, in Cicero, in your city, as it is in heaven. And this is what we've been praying as a church. I think you guys have been praying. I can feel the prayers of you people tonight. Like, Lord, we want your kingdom to reign where we are. Lord, let your footprint be established. Let it grow. Let it be expanded. I know I've been praying, Lord, let every crack house be turned into a glory house. Lord, let every uh, get block with gangbangers, Lord, let heaven come and invade that situation. Lord, let every dark place in our neighborhood be filled with light. Lord, let every broken place be put back together. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And Jesus is saying, hey, a portion of my kingdom is here. And he's saying, hey, I want you to keep on praying that it's expanded and it's growing. But let us not forget today, well, a portion is here. There is a day coming, and by a lot of signs, it could be coming very soon. That even though Jesus came riding in on a donkey as a suffering servant, can I remind seven people that he's not coming back on a donkey? That our God is coming back on a white horse. And at the end of times, he's coming back, and he's going to restore every broken place until his glory. And at the end of our life on this day, we will praise him night and day and day and night. We will worship him, and I can't wait for that day. And so Jesus says, but in the meantime, before that happens, don't just sit around. Let's pray that the kingdom is expanded, that more people come to know him, that my reign, my footprint is grown. And Jesus came preaching the message of the kingdom of God. And just as citizens, one more time, in the United States have, have rules, so do citizens of the kingdom. And Jesus here is about to leave earth in this text, and he's saying, listen. I want you to remember this. I am leaving, and don't get this messed up, because if you miss this, you're going to live like everybody else and fail where everybody else is failing. But I didn't come to establish what they thought. Don't get this wrong. And Jesus said, this is how I want my communities to function after I leave. This is the rule of my kingdom. And Jesus says this. He says, I'm about to leave, and this is what he tells them. And it's really simple. I give you a new command. Love each other just as much as I've loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you, what Jesus is saying, when, when you demonstrate the love that he's shown you, everyone will know who you roll with. Everyone will know who your daddy is. Everyone will know who you belong to. What Jesus is saying, hey, people will know that you roll with me, not based on your church attendance. 
Not based on your vast knowledge of scripture. Yeah, that's important, but that's not how people are going to know that you roll with me. People are not going to know that you roll with me based on what kind of car you drive or what kind of Insta following you got on the gram. How they're going to know you roll with me is simply by this, how you love the person in your row. And I'm just wondering tonight, how you doing loving your neighbor? Well, what Jesus is really saying, hey, if we get this right, it's going to be like that loud party on the block that you weren't invited to. Anybody have those besides me? I'm like, why don't you invite me? Because you know I'm a pastor. And <laughs> people are going to be looking in and be like, what is going on with all these crazy Christians over there? They got the same problems I got. They might have the same bank account I got. They just went to the same funeral I went to. But yet they won't stop praising. They won't stop shouting. They're so full of joy. And I just, what is going on over there? I think what Jesus is saying is simply this. If we get this right, we won't have to go looking for them. They'll come looking for us. And Jesus is just saying, hey, listen, this is how people will know. It's how you love one another. He's saying this is the number one rule in my kingdom. And I wonder today, does the world know us by that definition? You know, for me, I, I'm honestly sometimes a little nervous to tell people what I do for a living. Mm, wow. Because when I tell them I'm a pastor, two things happen. Maybe pastors can back me up on this. People either run away or they repent like I'm a priest. <laughs> and it just leaves me wondering, like, what, what do you think about us? If we were to go to the local mall, I don't know what that is. If we were to go out to eat after this and ask your server, hey, well, what do you think about Christians? Do you still associate them with love? Well, would they look at you and be like, man, I can't wait to bump into a Christian on the streets. They always let me into traffic. They always pick up the tab. They're always so generous. They always show me extra grace. They always help me back up when I fall down. They never judge me, right? What, what would people say? Because I don't think that's the narrative that we see. I think people know us by our political agendas. Mm. Wow. Wow. I think the world knows us by how we feel about Kanye's new album. Mm. I think they know us by some rules we put on doors so people can't get in. But do people still associate us with love? And I'm crazy enough to think tonight, church, that we should own the market on this thing called love. When people think of love, they should think a lifeline system of churches. And they should say those people, they're a little peculiar. They dance a little bit. They shout. You know what? But they love each other like I've never seen. And I'm telling you, when people see this, you know what happens is they lean in and say, what are you doing over there? And I've seen this in real time in my life. My wife, and some, some people, you guys know maybe you have a spouse like this, but my wife's better at this than me, honestly, at loving people. I've been trying to get better at it. But my wife's the kind of person I have to make sure that I'm in control of our finances because she would give every dollar we have every day of the week to people. <laughs> and one day after work, it was a Wednesday, I was driving home, and I said, hey, hon, I'm on the way home. just want to let you know. She said, hurry up. Uh, so-and-so from church um, needs to go take a 2,000-mile road trip, and she doesn't have the proper car. So I told her she can just take our car. I said, wait, like, when you said our car, you mean my truck? The, the one that I love. She said, yeah, what's the big deal? I'm like, it's my truck that's the big deal. So I get home. This girl comes, and her dad drops her off, and she gets in the car and goes. I'm, like, a little salty. She's on the road for a couple hours, and she calls my wife and said, hey, I just want to thank you so much for letting us use your truck. Listen, my dad dropped me off. He hasn't been to church for like a decade. And he was so shocked to see you guys, like what you did, that he's interested in coming to your church now. And you know what? I went back into the house, and I repented really quick because I'm so petty. And... <laughs> And I thought to myself, like, is it really that simple? Wow. 
that somebody in the body of Christ had a need and I had a resource and I met it. And you know what? Here, here's the thing, what I love about this. There was no smoke. I, I love haze machines, but there was no haze. There was no cool podcast. There was no YouTube channel. There was no hipster pastor. There was no worship concert. There was no sermon. There was no altar call. All this man saw was Christians being Christians. I'm telling you, when people see us loving each other, the word of God is true. We'll demonstrate to everyone who we are. And tonight, with just a short time I have left, here's what I want to give you is just three characteristics of this kind of love. Three characteristics of what does it mean to love people. And let me just give you a warning. I heard a pastor say this, and I feel the same way, and I'm going to steal it from him. He just said, it, it would be spiritual malpractice of me to not give you a warning with this. Because if you get this thing right, I just want to warn you, and you guys are well on your way. It's unbelievable what's going on here. But if you get this right, I'm telling you, when we start loving people the way that Jesus loves us, your church is going to look completely different. You're going to walk into your church on Sunday morning, and you're not going to have your seat. And there might be somebody with blue hair with a 5950 on, right, smelling like they just rolled around in a bed of Mary Jane, sitting down in a seat next to you. You know, we are praying this in our church, Lord, let us learn how to love people. And on Resurrection Sunday, our first service, this couple walked in the back, and it, they were, like, all over each other. We only have one door into our auditorium, and I, they must have smoked, like, 14 joints before they walked into our church. And I'm telling you, the whole back of our auditorium stunk like weed on Easter Sunday. And I was thinking to myself, man, let's go get some fans. But then I had to pause and remind myself, thank you, Jesus, that you're sending the misfits. But, but when we get this right, I'm just telling you, like, get ready for, for more services. And, and you know what? You think it's full now. There's going to be a line out the door. And we just have to get ready. You know, I'd like to worship with two hands in the air. But there's a kind of time coming. I think you might have to worship with one hand in the air and one hand on your iPhone because you don't know who's standing behind you. And it better be an iPhone. Androids are not of the Lord. Pastors, Pastors Reggie in London told me y'all are apostolic here. I'm telling you, listen. When we get this right, things are going to look a little different. And let me give you three characteristics about this love quickly tonight. Number one is it's defined. Jesus says in John 13, 34, I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I loved you. In the new commandment, to love each other was not a new commandment. We see this in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. We hear the rich young ruler talk about this. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This To love each other wasn't the new commandment. What the new commandment was, that Jesus said, I'm going to change the definition before I go. I just don't want you to love each other now. I want you to love each other the way that I loved you. Wow. Wow. And I'm telling you, he's saying this to a group of people who he's been rocking with for for three years, day and night. And when he said this, I, I can imagine these 12 disciples were like, listen, the old thing was hard enough, but now they have firsthand knowledge of the way that Jesus loved them. Yeah. And this is a big thing. And I think, well, why would Jesus do this? And I think simply because Jesus doesn't want us to be responsible to define words like love. Because left to our own devices, I would be like the rich, like the, 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 the good, the good uh, Samaritan, like who is my neighbor? Because I don't love you. There's some people in my church, if I had the choice, I'd be like, please don't come back next Sunday. You know, like, I surely wouldn't love, you know, like, I mean, how many of you know, like, there's people that you would choose not to love. But Jesus said, in case you ever get it twisted, listen to me, the new definition now is if you ever forget what love looks like, does it smell like me? Does it taste like me? Does it run like me? Does it walk like me? Does it talk like me? Does it touch like me? This is the new commandment to love each other the same way that Jesus loved us. 
And can I remind us tonight, church, I know you're at church on a Wednesday night because we're churchy people and we love Jesus. But let us never forget that the love of Jesus is radical, it's ridiculous, it's relentless, it's reckless. And maybe we can go on a trip down memory lane tonight and just if I could get seven people that could testify what the love of Jesus has done in your life tonight. How many of you would say today that he ran after you when you ran from him? That you stabbed him in the back and he came back running towards you anyways. That he picked you back up after you fell down, not twice, but 34 times. That you were divorced and he gave you a second chance. You were bound in chains of addiction. He said, I love you anyways. This is the love of Jesus. I never want to forget about the simple, radical love of Jesus. But we got to remember that this love is defined. Because what you're going to hear in culture is, listen, love is love. But what I'm telling you tonight, love ain't love. What you're going to hear in culture is, hey, if you love me, you would agree with me. But you know what? Because I love you like the way Jesus loved you, I love you too much to see you stuck in your mess. The culture is going to tell us, listen, if you love me, you'll endorse me. No, I love you the way Jesus loves you. But we got to understand that this is the definition. And I said all this to really set you up for this point tonight because I want to challenge us a little bit. Number two is that this love is developed. And some of you, like, could probably see it on your face. Like, this guy is, like, coming up here preaching on the love of God. Like, give me some deep stuff. I'm going to leave that to other people. Come on. Good. Apostle Michael's coming tomorrow. No. But here's the thing. Could it be tonight, church, that if we could, like, just maybe say, let's cancel the outreach program for a moment. Let's not focus on loving the lost for just one moment. Can I just talk to us for one moment? That sometimes it's not about loving the lost. That sometimes we have a hard enough time loving the found. And you know what? Could it be tonight that we're struggling in the shallow end with loving each other? That you know what? How many of us and we come and show up and we go home unchanged and we don't even talk to the people? And I'm telling you, left to our own devices, it's one thing to agree with this. It's another thing to live it tomorrow. But this is a love that's developed. And here's the thing. This is not human nature. Left to our own devices. I know people say trust your heart. That's the worst advice anybody could ever give you. Because you trust your heart and you wind up in another woman's bed. You trust your heart, you'll wind up in a ditch. I don't trust my heart for nothing. It's deceitful amongst all things. And left to my own devices, you know what's going to happen is that, you know what, I'm going to lean on me and I'm going to do me and I'm going to do what gets me good. But when I love like Jesus loved, it's not about me, it's about him. But but this love is developed. And I think this is human nature because we see this in this text. In John 13, 36, Peter, he's one of the greatest apostles who ever walked the earth. In John 13, 36, Jesus just gets done saying, hey, listen, I'm giving you some unbelievable gold here. I'm telling you, this is a new commandment. Jesus is sharing his heart. Peter interrupts Jesus. And he says, forget that. Like, where are you going? He goes right beyond what was important and focused on the urgent. And sometimes I think we have a tendency to do that as believers as well. We want to focus on urgent and not important things. And Jesus is just reminding us, listen, this love is going to require constant maintenance. It's not something that you're great in. This isn't something that we reach full achievement achievement of to the other side of glory. And if we want to grow in this, you know what we need to do? We need to get with the author of it. That there comes a point in time where we just got to get with Jesus say, search my heart and point out anything that it, in me that offends you. And some of us, we struggle with unforgiveness. Could it be because we never experienced forgiveness from our Father because you can't give something you never received? So many people are trying to give in public what you never received in the private place from our Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, this is where this love is growing and it's developed. And we just have a tendency sometimes to look right past this. And a good barometer is simply this. Do you love Jesus more than you did last year at camp meeting? My God. Pastors in the church, I, I've been questioning, I've been asking myself just to make sure my heart's right. Do I love Jesus more than when I started the church? Because God's people pay a toll on you. Amen. Do we love Jesus more than we did back then? 
And what we never want to happen is that God changes our eternity, but we never allow him to change our mentality. And you know what? I, it, it's so cool. Like, I, I, I'm so confused sometimes, though. Because it's like I meet so many people, and you're like saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you trusted God enough for your salvation, but you're still bitter. You trusted God enough for your salvation, but you're still walking in unforgiveness. You trusted God enough for your salvation, but your own family doesn't even want to talk to you because you're so angry and petty all the time at home. You trusted God for your salvation. Yes, that's awesome, but you're still racist. Come on. And I just never want to get to the point where I let God, I trust him enough for my eternity, but he doesn't change who I am right here, right now on this earth so I can go and change somebody else. And I, I'm a preacher's kid, so I grew up in church, so I've seen a lot of stuff. You got to pray for preacher's kids. <laughs> One thing I can never understand, though, is how somebody could get saved and delivered and set free. And the longer amount of time they spend in church, the meaner that they get. Yeah. And I've had people and I've got like, can you please like try to fix your face a little bit? We love Jesus, right? <laughs> like the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why do you look so mad? And people have looked at me like, it's just the way I am. <laughs> and it's kind of like, really? Because the Bible that I read says when you went down into the waters of baptism, that the old is gone and the new has come. Maybe you need to get with Jesus and let him deal with your heart a little bit more. This love is developed. It's something we grow in. And I'm telling you what I'm finding in my life is that, you know what, uh, the, the older that I get, the more resistant to change that I am. Can I get a witness? Yeah. I just have a hard time changing my mentality. I'm almost 40 years old now. Yeah. Seasoned saints are looking at me like, shut up, you know. <laughs> Talk to me when you got socks older. Come on. Um, but what I'm finding in my life is just the older I get, like, I'm just so resistant to change. And so this has just been my declaration in this season for, for me, and we've been saying this to our church. I just want to say this to you tonight, too, is that I don't ever want to be so stubborn in my religious ways that I miss the move of God in front of me because I don't like the way he's moving. Now, I call this, we need to be people who choose God's power over the religious process. That process is great, but God's power is better. A process is great, but God can do in one second what takes somebody else 10 years. And there's a real life example of this in the world. Do you, do you guys know that Netflix, actually Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix for $50 million? And today, Netflix is worth $170 billion, and Blockbuster has one store. Wow. And Blockbuster had a chance to embrace the trends and push forward of what's ahead or stick with the comfort of the systems that they knew, and they already knew, and they already saw, and they already celebrated in all the stores they already opened, and they chose what they already knew, and it led to their death. <laughs> and we see the same thing all throughout the Gospels. Jesus saves Zacchaeus. He crawls down from a tree. A chief tax collector gives half of his net worth back to Jesus. And the tax collector say, you can't take that money. Jesus is healing people on the Sabbath. And what do the Pharisees say? You can't heal on the Sabbath. Jesus like, I just did. You know, Jesus is touching people and rolling people and eating at their house. You can't hang with them and you can't touch them and you can't be with them. Jesus said, listen, I didn't come to build your kingdom. I came to build mine. And this is the way that I move. And I just don't want to be so stuck in my ways that I miss what God is doing in front of me because I don't like what it sounds like. I don't like what it feels like. I don't like the vessel it's coming through. We just need to be people who continually choose the power of God and what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. You know, when we started our church, we're, we're six years old. And when we started, we, we had this idea 
we want to start a church, you know, that, that just loves people. We're going to do the fishing. We're going to let the Holy Spirit do the cleaning. We're going to get people in the doors, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit clean. We want to be the kind of people we're going to love people. They can belong here before they behave. And then we started, and how many of you know God's funny? Because I, I knew people would have a problem with it. I just didn't know the people would be me. And the first, the first person to join our church, his name is Dana Lady. He moved from New York, and, you know, he came after the first service, said, man, I like it here. I'm going to come back. Came back the next week, said, I noticed you don't have a bass player. And, and I probably should have asked him if he's saved first because musicians, I love you. You guys are a little special. And, <laughs> and so I said, join the worship team. Can you play the bass? He said, sure. And so back in the day, our church was a 10 by 10 office. We met in a theater where you move everything down through the elevator shaft. And so I would be up there praying before church with all these guys moving stuff. And so they're getting ready for church. And, and all of a sudden, like, I hear this guy. And he's like, what the beep, beep, beep. And so I peek my head out. And it's my new bass player. <laughs> and I was just like, man, this is kind of a problem, right? <laughs> I mean, like, he's on the worship team, you know, like. So I start praying. I'm like, Lord, can you please tell me how to confront this? And I, I felt that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Didn't you say that you wanted to be the kind of place that lets people belong before they behave? Maybe instead of looking at his behavior, you should look at his direction. Is he leaning closer to me? Is he growing closer to me? I said, yes, sir. I'll listen. And so next week he comes back and he shows up with two friends. I'm like, where'd you meet these guys from? Says with no shame. I met him at the bar last night. And I was like, well, man, you brought more people to church than me. Let's go. You know, come on, let's go. And so, and then he comes back. He keeps on coming, and I see some growth. And, and then one week he comes with, with, with a lady. I said, who's this lady? He said, this is my new fiance. I said, where'd you meet her at? The same bar I brought those guys from. <laughs> Good Lord, this is not getting any better. You know what he said to me next, though? He said, listen, um, we're trying to do this right. And um, it's really hard out here in these streets. And, like, we're trying. We say, like, you got to have a ring before you do the thing. And he's like, I, I want to do things right the way that God wants me to do it. So can you do a crash course of premarital counseling so I can get married so we can do this right? And can I be honest? I thought to myself, this is 50% more mature than half my church. And you know, you know what happened now? Five years later, six years later, what happens now, Dana Lade is still our bass player. He is the most faithful man of God that I've ever met. He shows up on time. He's in a committed marriage. He's a good father. He's a good husband. And you know what? Now when I talk to him in between services, you know what he's doing? He's not cussing. He's quoting scripture at me. Today in my devotional, listen to what God did. And I just wanted to tell you that today because I almost missed it because I was so stuck in my religious mindset that I almost missed the move of God because I didn't like the way that God was moving in front of me. And I wonder how many times that we miss what God is doing right in front of our eyes because we don't like what it talks like. Can I tell you, there's a pecking order of these things. That yes, the man's mouth was a problem. But before his mouth got converted, there was a heart that Jesus cared about. That Jesus said, I died for. That Jesus said, I got you. And we just got to understand this with people. And there's going to come a time in your life when God is going to lead you. He's going to say, go do something unprecedented. And people are going to look at you the same way the Pharisees looked at them. And you're going to say, hey, you know what? Jesus broke every single religious process to get to me. And I never want to forget what Jesus did for me. That I was the most unworthy of them all. And can I tell you tonight, this is how God works. I had no idea why I got invited tonight. Some of you are still like, I still don't know why you got invited. But could it be that God loves us so much he put my name in somebody else's heart? Yeah. Yeah. That when God has a plan for your life, you don't need to promote yourself, that God promotes you. Yeah. That you walk in that lane and you do what God said to do and you just walk with him and talk with him. 
and God will do what only God can do. But this love is the kind of love that needs to be developed daily. And I think, church, can we just make an agreement tonight that we choose God's power? It might not look right yet. You know, we all pray for revival until revival happens, then we complain about it. Because lost people come, but lost people don't know how to talk yet, and they don't know how to act yet, and they don't know how to dress yet. I find myself praying at the altars at our church on Sunday morning like this, because I don't want to be accused of anything, because people don't know how to dress yet. Maybe we, we can just agree on that. We, we choose the power of God. Let me wrap up with this tonight. The love of God is defined, it's developed, and it's dangerous when demonstrated. It's not just shown by talking or texting. It's not shown by emojis on a screen. This kind of love Christ commands from us is far more than warm feelings. And when we demonstrate this love, it's dangerous. The love of Jesus is explosive. It causes fights. It left people either flocking to Jesus or running away. It was this love that caused Jesus to be murdered. It was this love that started a revolution all those years ago, and there's still a revolution today that we fight for. And it's dangerous when demonstrated. And the Apostle Paul speaks of this in Galatians 6. Paul is saying, he's pointing back to Jesus' great command. He's saying, this is what this new command, when you live it out in your communities, looks like. Paul is pointing back to what Jesus said in Galatians 6, 1 and 3. And he says this, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, should gently and humbly help the person back up onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same, te same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. And if you think you're too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Paul here is saying that by showing sympathy to other believers in times of trouble whether it be physical, mental, emotional, and sharing their burden, that we will best fulfill Christ's command to love one another the way he loved us. Another way to say it, carry each other's burdens, is just to help each other out. You know what that means to me is that when you cry, I cry. You hurt, I hurt. You got somebody in jail, we all got somebody in jail. We're going to pray until they get back home. You're hungry, I got some food. And sometimes, you know, this has become our common response in church circles sometimes. Like, hey, how you doing? And the common response is, God is good. And then you say, All the time. And then in a rare moment of transparency, what happens? Is that you say, I had a tough week. And our response is, I'll pray for you. Like, all week, I'm going to pray for you. All week. Can I tell you what's better than prayer? Prayer and money. Is this too practical? Prayer and your pastors have a vision to wrap the love, what do you call it? The love mobile. That thing is dope. <laughs> we got a need, I got some seed. You know what's better than prayer? Prayer and showing up. Prayer, you're in the hospital and I'm going to come visit. Prayer and you're sick and I ain't leaving until you get better. This is the way that we love one another. I'm telling you, this love is dangerous when demonstrated. But I need to remind you one more time, this love is dangerous. It's dangerous to your time. It's dangerous to your religious paradigm. It will be dangerous to your reputation. You'll be angry sometimes because you help people out and they won't give you any credit. It's dangerous. But Paul here is reminding us the best way to live this Christian life is simply by helping each other out. And to me, I just wanted to show you guys as I close tonight maybe what this looks like. Can you guys give it up for my dudes back here? To, to me, this is kind of what helping each other out looks like. I see, I see my brother. What's your name? Uh, Tyler. Tyler. Give it up for Tyler one more time. And, and I see Tyler, and he's carrying this weight of anxiety. And I just look at Tyler and say, hey, listen, man, I'm not dealing with this right now. I actually overcame this. But listen, you're dealing with anxiety. I'm dealing with anxiety. If you need help, here's my cell phone number. You call me anytime, day or night. If you got any thoughts in your head, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to be there for you. Listen, I got your back, my brother, okay? I am with you. Don't, don't walk away from me, okay? I'm with you. I got you. Come on, bring it in, okay? I'm going to walk with you. And then we're going to go, and, and then I'm going to throw this in here.
strap this on my back. I'm going to go to the next, see somebody else from my church and say, hey, man, how you doing? You're having family problems right now? Well, listen, I'm not really in that place, but if you got a need, I can help you out. Listen, your dad's not here. I'll be your dad. I'll teach you how to tie a tie. I'll teach you how to dress. Listen, you don't know how to go on an interview. I'll teach you how to go on an interview. You rock with me. I got your back. You know what? You come live at my house. You got nothing. I, I got your back. You need money? I got money, okay? I'm with you. Come on, bring it in, okay? You're dealing with that way? Let me, let me have that. And then, I'm going to put that in my bag. Good Lord, that's heavy. And I'm going to go to work. And my coworkers are going to look at me and say, hey, you look kind of different. Why are you walking with a limp? I'm going to say, I don't know, because I've never felt better. I'm just doing life with my brothers. You know what? I'm feeling things that I never felt before. I got things coming alive in me as I'm walking life with my brothers that I never felt before. You know what your coworkers start to do? They start leaning in and looking. And then I see my next brother on the street, and I look at him. And I say, hey, man. You're black. I'm white. But you're my brother in Christ. So listen, if you ever feel like people have been prejudiced against you, they're prejudiced against me. You feel like there's a problem in your school? Now they got a problem with me. My son likes to say, you pick a fight with me, you pick a fight with my whole family. We all show up. And I'm going to take this from you and say, listen, man, I got your back. And we might walk out in public, and you know what's going to happen is people will look at us a little funny. I might not be welcome where I used to be welcome, but I don't care because I'm doing life with my family, and I love the way that Jesus loved. And then I'm going to put this in. We're walking around. And here's the thing we got to remember today. If this burden never feels too heavy... Let us never forget that Jesus took your burden and strapped it on his back and climbed up and was strapped to a tree. And he said, listen, you might be weighing this and you might be carrying this and you don't think that you can handle this. The good news is that you don't because I died for you when nobody else could die for you. And you don't need to carry this any longer because by my stripes you are healed. In Jesus' name, live a free life. See, Jesus did for you which you could never do for yourself. He wore for you what you couldn't handle the burden of. And tonight, let us never forget rule number one. Jesus says in my kingdom, you want to see heaven on earth, you need to love each other the way that I loved you. And if we could stand tonight, thank you guys for your time. And I really just wanted to preach this tonight I was driving to church a few weeks ago and I was just like praying for our services honestly and lifeline popped into my heart and I've never been here before so I didn't know what I was getting into at all and the Lord just I actually pulled over and wrote this down because it was so it was such a burden on my heart I was like weeping but the Lord really just told me tonight, and I don't say this like flippantly for you all to get ready that you all need to be ready for what's about to happen in the lifeline system of churches. That because of the grace, the apostolic mantle on these two, I'm telling you, there's gonna be explosive growth coming to this body. And I just wanted to tell you guys tonight, get ready for what God is going to do because there's going to be people walking in the doors that you're going to say aren't worthy. And you need to remember rule number one, I'm going to love you the way that Jesus loved you. I'm going to love you to your next level. And I was just, Pastors Reggie and London, I just, um, we briefly talked via Facebook Messenger about your heart for adoption. And the Lord just really told me to tell you guys tonight what you have a heart for physically. God said it's actually a sign of what I'm going to do spiritually. That there is an influx of orphaned spiritual sons and daughters that are going to call you guys mom and dad. And what's going to happen here is that they're going to find life and life abundant. 
And if it's okay, I just want to pray for you. I, I don't know what you've been through in your life, but the Lord told me it's been a lot. You've paid a high price to get to where you are. And the Lord said there's just some things I had to do in you. He says, I'm sorry, but I had to work deep in you because the work of God, the move of God is going to be so great in your life. But sons and daughters, how many of you guys believe that are coming home? Spiritually orphaned are coming home. And Lord, right now, we just bless pastors Reggie in London. Lord, I thank you for the grace on their life. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this. It's not just going to be African-Americans either. I think this is something you guys got to get ready for, too. I'm, I'm in your family now, whether you like it or not. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for Hispanics, and Caucasians, and African-American sons and daughters, spiritually orphaned. I see those who have been wounded greatly by the church. So you're going to give them life and life abundantly and restore their hope in the bride of Christ. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, even for fresh systems and fresh revelation. Lord, I thank you for the sons that are even in the house tonight and the explosive growth that's going to happen at Lifeline Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. And tonight, real quick, if you guys could just raise your hands. I just want to pray for you. If you would say tonight, there's some parts of my heart that I just need to do better at in loving people. Can you raise your hands high? You just know, like, there's some people. There's some people that God has connected you with divinely in this season. And what we need to understand is that heaven doesn't come through pastors. Heaven comes through people on this earth. And when God wants to do it, he's going to do it through your hands, through your heart. And Lord, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray for heart surgery amongst your people tonight. Lord, let every broken place, Lord, come into alignment with who you are. And Jesus, tonight, our declaration is we love you so much, Lord. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us another chance, Lord. Thank you for dying for us, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that your fire comes upon us in a fresh way tonight, tomorrow, the next day. And Lord, I thank you that we are forever changed in Jesus' name. Lord, do what only you can do. We love you, Lord. We lift you up and we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the adoration. Lord, we say you are holy, you are worthy, you are good, you are righteous, you are king of all kings and Lord of all lords. And come on, church, one more time tonight. Let's give God a big shout of praise. Come on and praise him, church.